Okay, I think we are live now. So welcome to this uh, third day. We are on the third day uh, session. Uh, all experts and uh, who have been, you have been very much into this retrofitting and building health mapping and uh, reliving or relieving into buildings that which are uh, considered to be rejected or not livable even though there are many live examples are going on, like the incident that happened on 10th February, followed by some eviction order given to one of the apartment complex in Gurgaon. Uh, we are familiar with the kind of testing that have been done and then evaluation and reporting being done by expert agency as well as organizations in our country. Uh, these have raised a lot of uh, lot of doubts as well as pointing towards that who have built the building, who have built the building or which are the organization. We all know that these days, but uh, today uh, we are going to talk about the, uh, especially uh, your experience about how retrofitted building are going to perform or performing well and what kind of database that you are keeping and what are the new projects that you are uh, going on with your own uh, organizations. Uh, that is what that today will be highlighted on that, especially performance of retrofitted uh, facilities or building. So you have a lot of experience on that. We expect that our participants will be enjoying this. They are joining very fast. And in fact, more than 300 participants are there uh, in all the last two days, uh, which is uh, very good. Uh, uh, that I would say the response, as well as their questions they will be asking in the chat box, as well as whenever they ask some questions or they are raising their hands, we bring them in the panel so that they can get the chance to speak directly with, uh, with the experts. Good afternoon to one and all present here. Welcome you all to the third day of the three-day online training program on infrastructure health mapping standards and retrofitting of built-up facilities. This online training program is jointly organized by Civil Engineering and Construction Review and National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, powered by Revered Media. Welcoming our distinguished speakers for the day, Professor Chandan Ghosh, Professor and Head, Resilient Infrastructure Division, NIDM, Government of India. Mr. Sandeep Shah, Country Head and Managing Director, India, Mayamoto International. Engineer Chetan R. Raikar, Managing Director, Structural Designers and Culture. Consultants Private Limited. Engineer Saurav Manjrekar, Director, Sunanda Specialty Coatings Private Limited. Before we start with today's session, I would like to present a brief summary of the past two days of this online training program on infrastructure health mapping standards and retrofitting of built up facilities. Day one of this online training program started with the opening remarks by Professor Chandan Ghosh, Head, Resilient Infrastructure Division, NIDM. Shri Taj Hassan, IPS, Executive Director, Additional Charge, NIDM, Government of India, was the chief guest. Special guest, Dr. K.M. Soni, former Additional Director General, Central Public Works Department, and Engineer Sanjeev Kumar, Director, IAHE, Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways, India, presided the training session. Lead lecture on health checkup of built up concrete structures was presented by Dr. Vishwajit Bhattacharji, Emeritus Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Delhi. Presentation on online certification and assessment of building health was given by Mr. Manish Bharti, CEO. Cortex Construction Solutions Private Limited. The day was concluded with panel discussion and Q&A session. Moving on to day two, an educational and dynamic day two 
of this online training program was graced with the opening remarks by Professor Chandan Ghosh. The honorable panelist, Mr. Mr. Nitin S. Verma, managing partner, Aadhaar Consultancy Infrastructure, shared his detailed lecture on tools and techniques for retrofitting structures. His presentation highlights were on structural distress, beam shear off, seismic microization of NCT Delhi, designing structural retrofitting measures, pillar, beam, and slab rehabilitation, repairs of structure, and soil anchors installation. The next honorable panelist, Dr. Gopal Rai, director, RNM International, shared his detailed lecture on re rehabilitation of infrastructure as nation building. His presentation highlights were modeling of bridge guider, recommendations and procedure of strengthening and carbon fiber wrapping. The next honorable panelist, Mr. Gaurav Ghosh, structural engineer, Resistoflex Group, shared his detailed lecture on Resistoflex building in Noida, construction and experience sharing. His presentation highlights were Resistoflex soil excavation, ground seismic assessment, bearing installation, displacement response of the isolation system, and ETABS analytical models. It was an exceptionally informative and a successful session followed by panel discussion and interactive Q&A. Today's sub-theme is performance of retrofitted facilities. If you wish to receive an e-certificate for attending this training program, Kindly register yourself in NIDM's portal. Please visit training.nidm.gov.in. Today is the last day to register. Introducing our first speaker for the day, Mr. Sandeep Shah, Country Head and Managing Director, India, Miyamoto International. Sandeep Shah has more than 32 years of engineering experience. His engineering career started with him getting commissioned in the Corps of Engineers, Indian Army in 1989. While in Army, he participated in the Kargil War, UN operations in Sierra Leone, Operation Parakram and anti-insurgency operation Rakshak. He did his master's in earthquake and civil engineering dynamics from University of Sheffield, UK. Mr. Shah, has designed many iconic and complex projects, including the ATC Tower at Delhi Airport and specializes in performance-based design. He has been instrumental in introducing advanced and latest earthquake protection technologies in India to include dampers, base isolation, tuned mass dampers, and earthquake alarm systems. His specialization is performance-based design using dampers, both for new and existing buildings. His company is undertaking structural design projects in many countries like United States, Mexico, Peru, New Zealand, Haiti, and more. Over to you, sir. Uh Thank you uh, for uh, handing me over the control. Uh, can can you see my screen, please? Yes, sir. Okay, great. <clears throat> so to start with, uh, most people ask what dampers are. And, um, you know, a very simple explanation is a miniature model, which just depicts uh, what a building without damper does and what a building with damper does. It's a, it's a small... Uh, video and so in very simple terms dampers are nothing but like shock absorbers of your car and uh, this, so they reduce 
the demand on the structure. If the demand on the structure during during uh, you, uh, lateral movements like uh, seismic yeah, seismic event is reduced, the structure uh, does not damage and thereby survives even major earthquakes. Now, where do where do dampers? Uh, before I start dwelling in, more into our presentations, I've tried to make it uh, more uh, pictorial, uh, uh, not getting into theory too much because I know all uh, attendees are not in, uh, structural engineers. Uh, and I've tried to explain it, uh, uh, you know, in a very uh, uh, pictorial manner so that uh, not to confuse people. Uh, if anyone has some detailed queries, they are free to email me and write to me uh, at their convenience. Uh, so where do dampers uh, find use in buildings? Uh, you know, uh, dampers find use in buildings that are designed to perform better than the normal normal structures. Most people will be very surprised to learn that what earthquake resistant means is earthquake resistant building means is that if uh, there is a major earthquake, which we in structural terms called a MCE event, the building will be non-usable after that event. That means you will not be able to use the building. However, the uh, 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 there should be no, it should not have a pancake collapse there by jeopardizing the lives of occupants. So that is what an earthquake resistant building means. Uh, and that's what we design and we construct. But not all occupants want the building to uh, perform at the minimum standard. People want the building to perform to immediate occupancy and operational standards. Immediate occupancy basically means a building will be immediately be uh, uh, ready to occupy and use after a, even a major earthquake. And operational performance is a performance in which the building, not only the structural elements, but even all the non-structural elements, may it be electricity, plumbing, HVAC, oxygen lines, anything, internet lines will be operational. So these are these are categories of buildings which which are warranted uh, by the clients to perform in a better manner and dampers for, form extensive usage there. Buildings which target reduced floor accelerations. I will try and show this through some examples uh, of uh, photographs uh, which I've uh, picked up from facilities using dampers where accelerations floor accelerations need to be minimized. Hospitals and post-emergency use buildings, important office buildings uh, who want business continuity, buildings that need retrofit or upgrade to latest codes. Uh, sometimes dampers is the best and the cheapest solution available. There will be a case study, which I'll be showing just to you just now. Buildings which have undergone a change of use uh, and now are at a higher importance factor. Buildings that need drift control that sway too much and they need a drift uh, control buildings having torsional irregularity. So to control the torsional response of a structure, you can put dampers. Buildings on stilts, you know, buildings on stilts are extremely dangerous. Um, I, I, I still, uh, you know, uh, shiver to even uh, think about a scenario of what's going to happen in an earthquake for all these buildings that have been built on stilts and are not adequately uh, protected from earthquakes. Buildings having plan or vertical irregularities. Sir, sorry Present. to interrupt you. Yeah. Your slides are not moving. My slides are not moving. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 let me let our me... participants are complaining that they cannot see the slides. Okay, let me stop share and yeah, share again. Try one yeah, just a minute. Okay. Uh, so did they did they see the video or they didn't see the video? Um, no, sir. There wasn't any video. Oh my. Oh, okay, okay. So just a minute. Yes, sir. So can you can you can you see the slide now? We can see your first slide. So uh, just a minute. <clears throat> um, okay, let me Can you see my slide now? And I am going to go on. Uh, can you? Can every? We cannot see your slide, sir. Uh, not you yet. Can't. It's visible now. Your third slide is visible now. 
okay okay so so uh, should i should i play this uh, play this and yes sir yes do let me know if you can't see the video sure there is no audio um okay i for me i am getting the audio i am just being able to listen to you um anyway uh, uh, can you listen to my voice yes sir okay so let me just let me just quickly now move on to the next slide so this is a slide that i explained uh, getting on to the design codes uh, presently uh, unfortunately uh, the the performance based design codes are not available in india uh, there will be a stage where they will be available uh, it is extremely extremely important uh, safety requirement for the country uh, I, and i hope it will be met sometime in the near near future so presently anybody wants to undertake performance based design code has to refer uh, either asc 7 for new buildings or asc 41 for existing buildings what do dampers look like so dampers are so something similar to like uh, somewhere similar to the cut sections that you are seeing uh, one is of a clevis base plate type other is a clevis clevis type uh, it has a interior a, a mechanism where fluid flows from one chamber to the other Uh, it's a very complex mechanism it's not a simple mechanism mechanism as you are seeing over here and by movement of this uh, fluid uh, uh, energy is uh, dissipated so this is a very interesting uh, graph that i like to show people because uh, it it gives to them uh, you know what is the efficacy of these uh, dampers so uh, on the left hand side is a maximum credible earthquake on the right hand side is a design basis earthquake now dampers which are uh, uh, optimized for a structure for maximum credible earthquake they are absorbing about 60% of the energy and under design basis earthquake they are absorbing about 70 to 75% of the energy so you can imagine that your entire building that you have built it may be a you know a five story building 10 story building or a 50 story building the all the elements together uh made be shear walls columns beams are just able to absorb uh, you know possibly between 30 to 40% of the energy so the entire force earthquake force goes into the dampers the dampers absorb that energy keeping the structures safe so the portion in blue is the portion that is the energy absorbed by dampers and the po portion shown in pink is the energy absorbed by the structure now just to give you a few examples where dampers are used slender buildings you know which which require drift control so uh, you see over here in red the dampers are highlighted and this building is stiff enough in one direction but not stiff in the other direction therefore the use of dampers for drift control in manufacturing facilities which require floor exfoliations to be kept to a minimum so that uh, so there are many facilities where where there are restrictions in um, uh, floor exfoliation because of the sensitivity of the equipment that is installed sometimes the the uh, limits are 0.2 g even in uh, uh, you know even in a uh, in a large earthquake sometimes it is even of the order of 0.1 g <clears throat> hospitals hospitals are most essential buildings uh, requiring special codes and special performance so there are many hospitals the world over they do do not want to pull down the building but they want to improve the performance and they do it by by installing dampers uh, this is a base isolation base isolated uh, hospital project along with dampers high rise buildings uh, very very common buildings susceptible to wind events uh, again very uh, common Uh, buildings which are which need to be built near fault lines so there are some essential buildings which per force need to be in near the fault line like the one which is uh, shown here and they to use uh, dampers you now uh, uh, the usp of dampers is they are extremely reliable 50 years warranty you know they have a life of 100 years and beyond aerospars uh, qualified and they are even as good as new even after a mce event Uh, uh, comes across. 
So coming back to my topic, which is a seismic upgrade of an existing building, which is New Udan Bhavan, the uh, headquarters of GMR, GMR Group. So this is the building that you see, uh, which is, uh, which, which is uh, in, the, in the square shape at the background. Now, why the building needed an upgrade? So that's important to understand this. The building did not meet the minimum code requirements. The, and the owners wanted the building to be operational even after a design basis earthquake. The standard of performance that was uh, uh, quantified for this particular building was immediate occupancy. The building needed to perform without collapse and with acceptable damage even under MCE conditions. So it was the dampers are so designed that even in MCE conditions, they will work equally effectively and uh, uh, keep the building, uh, uh, building performance as habitable after the earthquake. Uh, prevention. So they, uh, uh, GMR as a group wanted to uh, wanted to uh, preserve business continuity, uh, being an essential um, uh, company dealing with infrastructure of the uh, country. Uh, so th they wanted their office space to be habitable even in an earthquake event and preservation of life. So what we did was we used uh, you, we made a, a, a more we modeled the building in uh, ETAPS. Uh, these are some definitions of immediate occupancy and collapse prevention. Collapse prevention is the minimum code requirement, whereas immediate occupancy is an enhanced uh, uh, requirement, which is specified by the client. The challenges we had in this building is that the building did not close at any moment of time. The buildings did not vacate. They, sh they were least disruption. We were told uh, least or nil disruption to the interiors. No disruption to the office working hours, quality only 100%, maintain timelines of construction and maintain the completion uh, timelines as uh, stipulated by, by the group. So the anal analytical model put the dampers, installed the dampers, uh, something like this in a crisscross manner. And we chose uh, various uh, time histories. Um, we scaled them up to the uh, response spectra uh, for zone zone four, so these are the uh, records. So one of the sample of the records uh, where you see the scaling. So this graph is what uh, one of the dampers did during the earthquake. So if you see these hysteresis loops, all the area inside this hysteresis loop is the energy dissipated by the damper. Damper works, fluid viscous dampers work beautifully even for a very, very small earthquake, for a small earthquake, a medium earthquake, large earthquake, and a very, very large earthquake. All other technologies are optimized to a certain level of earthquake, but which is not the case with fluid viscous dampers. If you install fluid viscous dampers, they'll work from very, very small earthquakes to a very, very large earthquake. That's the beauty of the technology because there's, it, it does not have any stiffness and can uh, perform exceedingly well to any uh, form of lateral movement, you know, which in, induces stroke in the damper. So this is the, the this is the comp so approximately this is the graph that we show. The total energy is under the red uh, uh, red line, and the energy absorbed by the dampers is under the is under the blue line. So how we designed the dampers is to uh, absorb approximately sixty percent of the earthquake energy, and. Uh, the, the objectives were, was to keep the drifts below 0.8%. So below 1% 1, 1 is generally where we classify a building as immediate occupancy. But in this case, we wanted it to be below 0.8%. And so you see that, uh, you, you know, just on first floor, we had a marginal increase. Otherwise, we were well within the limits um, of, uh, you know, e even immediate occupancy or even better than immediate occupancy. There was a 25% reduction in the base share demand, uh, uh, which uh, so uh, when you when you introduce fluid viscous dampers, uh, they they will reduce the base share and uh, not one but all elements of a structure will benefit if you are installing dampers or absorbing energy uh, through dampers. Uh, we then designed the connections. Uh, so uh, you know uh, there were dampers braces connected to the central portion of the beam. And there were braces connected to the beam, beam column joint. So this is the some of the designs of connections. There were some plinth beams which were which were slender and needed strengthening. 
so the plinth beams were strengthened by uh, by putting in additional reinforcement and uh, concrete. The the structural steel was fabricated off site in a factory. So these these are the basically grades of steel that we use. We followed the U.S. standards. And this is the grade of grades of uh, steels we use to fabricate the damper attachments, steel attachments. The front elevations uh, uh, look something like this. Uh, this is on the top that is you see a facade elements are covering certain portion, and the picture below it it, it shows the complete brace. But when you visually now go and see that, you will uh, find it uh, something what what is what is on the uh, upper image. This is the rear elevation. And these are the side elevations. So all the dampers were installed on the periphery. Uh, uh, thereby, you know, uh, the, the there was no work happening inside the building, and that kept it uh, functional. Once we designed the dampers, uh, the dampers were manufactured. They were tested. They were tested in front of the client. So all the dampers were tested in uh, front of the client. Uh, here you see. Auto, automated uh, uh, graphs getting uh, pr produced after while well testing has happened. Those graphs are given as record to the client. Uh, this is one of the test samples that you see uh, uh, in the test bed. And <clears throat> these are some of the pics of the finished uh, building. Okay, now uh, having, having seen this, let us see some more uses of dampers. Uh, pictorially, uh, you, will, you will kind of assimilate and remember these uh, where they can be used at uh, later. So, so buildings that have a soft story, you know, you, it's very easy to install dampers and protect them. Uh, building where you want an overall seismic uh, in, uh, improvement in the seismic performance, very easily you can install dampers there. Dampers for seismic retrofit, like the, this project. Dampers to control wherever there are long spans and you want to, to want to control the floor accelerations and drifts. You know, you can use dampers there, like, like, like this project. You can use dampers to upgrade buildings to the latest code requirements. So, so you know, codes they keep getting upgraded from time to time. So there's a way that you can actually improve the a building to the latest code requirements. The build, there are many office buildings there which will like to uh, sell the USP of immediate occupancy and you know for rental purposes or for or to clients. So you can use dampers there. Uh, to end with, let's see dampers getting installed on one of the projects. Thank you. I think I finished uh, within my allocated time of 30 minutes and uh, over, over to the organizers. An announcement to all the participants. As Mr. Shah has to leave early, if you have any questions, please take up right now.
so if if there are uh, no questions uh, am i am i allowed to leave somebody has just asked a question what are the cost implications so uh, just to give you a thumb rule you know the cost will vary from uh, from project to project but just to give you a thumb rule uh, uh, you should uh, budget it at about 350 rupees a square foot uh, provided your building is at least uh, you know uh, about uh, 1.5 to 2 lakh square foot in size because if it's a very small building you use even a few dampers the cost will be more but uh, you know if your building is uh, let's say Uh, 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 about 1.5 2 lakh square feet so you a thumb rule of 350 rupees a square foot can be assumed there's another question which says uh, uh, is there any maintenance requirement there is no maintenance required whatsoever that our um, warranty certificate states that there is no maintenance required to the dampers the dampers our dampers come with a warranty of 35 years then we test 5% of the dampers and we extend the warranty by another 15 years so like we say we warranty our dampers for 50 years the life of our dampers that we claim is 100 years and beyond uh, i do not see any other questions any other questions please let me know or uh, else i think i will hand it back to the organizers So there's another question in the Q&A session. Okay, Q&A. Uh, so costs of the building I have come. Uh, uh, I have completed. Can terrace level dampers uh, be used in retrofitting? Yes. Uh, uh, you see the beauty of um, uh, fluid viscous dampers as compared to all other dampers is you can pick and choose the locations where you where you want to install fluid viscous dampers. For example, let's say you want to put. Uh, uh, a different type of damper like a metal yield damper or a friction damper you will have to use dampers right from the foundation to the roof in a particular bay right there is no option because basically it is creating a bay like a shear wall right it may be a metal yield damper it may be a friction damper things of the sort but if you want to use fluid viscous dampers you can pick and choose where you want to install it so you may install it in two floors uh, you may install, uh, leave three floors in between you may install it in the next two floors and then uh, you can see the response uh, stimulated response on your uh, uh, etabs model and and see how your building is performing so there's another question from mr manish singhal he's asking can these dampers be used in bridges oh yes very much uh bridges use use dampers uh, extensively very extensively uh if you visit our website www.tailordevicesindia.com you will see there's a sub- uh, separate section we have dedicated for bridges bridges use two type of equipment so one is uh, dampers uh, which absorb the seismic energy through stroking of the piston and the second is shock absorb uh, uh, shock uh, transmission units shock transmission units uh, basically locks the superstructure and the pier so so the superstructure on on which you you have your roadway running or your railway running uh, that gets locked uh, uh, to the pier so uh, so that there is equal distribution of forces in the entire structure so bridges use two type of uh, 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 devices shock transmission units and dampers buildings primarily use dampers uh, which which stroke and absorb energy Okay, so so I cannot see any more questions. Just a minute. Thank you, sir, for your insightful presentation. Thank you. The Institute of Disaster Management and Civil Engineering and Construction Review presents certificate of appreciation to Mr. Sandeep Shah for the expert lecture on seismic upgrade of new Uran Bhavan using fluid viscous dampers. during the 3 days online training program on infrastructure health mapping standards and retrofitting of built up facilities from 23rd to 25th february 2022 thank you thank you does does chetan have a question okay thank you thank you okay thank you very much thank you thank you sir introducing our next speaker for the day engineer Ethan R Raiko managing director structural designers and consultants private limited Mr Raiko is a professional structural engineer with a bachelor degree in civil engineering from Sardar Patel University Gujarat and master's degree of science in conservation of heritage structure 
from Harriet Watt University, Edinburgh, UK. Although he is a remarkable structural engineer, his true passion lies in conservation of heritage structures. He has achieved great heights of success by crediting some of the notable heritage conservation projects to his stride, making him one of the renowned conservationists in the country today. He has to his credit many awards such as Young Member Award for Professional Achievement in 1999 and Chapter Activity Awards in 2018 by American Concrete Institute. Excellence Vocational Award by Rotary International District in 2009, Maharashtra Chakohinur Award in March 2013 by Government of Maharashtra. Mr. Raikar is a member of many professional bodies that includes Institute of Engineers, Indian Institute of Bridge Engineers, Indian Heritage Society, Indian Society of Structural Engineers, Engineering Council of India, etc. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Can you can you hear me? Yes, sir. I will I will now try to start my uh, presentation. And, uh, let me try and see how I share my screen. We cannot see your screen, sir, as it. Hi, right, can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. Can I put it on the slideshow? Is this better? Yes, sir. Performance evaluation of retrofitted structures and case studies. This is what I thought I would share today. Uh, thank you very much CCR and NIBM for giving me this opportunity to share a few of my thoughts. What's retrofitting? Retrofitting is the process of strengthening of a structure along with structural system. So what we are talking of is, is as per the prevalent codal provisions. That's what the earlier speaker also was talking about. How do we upgrade the structures to the newer uh, codal provisions? What are the other types of treatments to structures? We have re-strengthening, we have rehabilitation, we have restoration and we have repairs. I will not, I will not take you around with, through the, uh, what exactly each one of it is. But let's go to the next slide, what it says. How does one evaluate the performance of structures? There are various techniques, but I, I find three or four of the following techniques are very useful when we talk of performance. Performance is when you study a structure over a few years, few months, few days, things like that. Topmost would be user's feedback. He may be a technical person, a non-technical person, but still user's feedback is extremely important because you may be monitoring a structure for vibrations. So uh, user's feedback is extremely important in that. You may be uh, evaluating, a, evaluating performance of a structure for leakage. User's feedback is extremely important. Visual observations. Nothing can substitute trained eyesight. That's what I mean. Because uh, an expert can easily identify cracks the reasons for it, and in most cases, even the root cause analysis of the cracks. Instrumentation is definitely useful. It can confirm. Non-destructive testing before the event and after the event. But in case of an event like an earthquake or floods, you may not have earthquake, uh, cyclones and floods, etc. You may not have the readings before, so you only have readings after. And last is the structural health monitoring, where you are 
installing uh, quite a few gadgets, uh, uh, vibration meters, tilt meters, and so many, depending on what the requirement is, uh, strain gauges and things like that. And then uh, you are monitoring the structure over a period of defined duration. Ultrasonic pulse velocity is, is for spot identification or spot reading of a specific area. It can be used on stones also, it can be used on wood also, it can be used on concrete. We are, we are uh, our country is using ultrasonic for almost four decades and did not uh, waste more time of everyone on this. Crack width monitoring. This is a manual uh, monitoring uh, technique, but you can use uh, automated uh, crack width monitoring techniques also. They are easily available today. GPR, ground penetrating radar, is, is a technique which is extremely uh, good, accurate, and effective. It can identify voids in concrete or any other building material for that matter which are as small as is a ping pong ball, table tennis ball. It's very accurate. We have successfully identified voids in pre-stressing tendons using a, a radar as the instrument. Radar can be used in horizontal position, vertical position, and so many locations. It is superior to ultrasonic because ultrasonic is only identifying the voids at the spot, whereas radar is scanning the entire area of concrete or any other building material that we are trying to scan. Uh, radar can be also used for knowing where to grout, which locations. We have successfully used it in uh, so many basements where uh, by merely grouting a few kgs of cement, we have been able to stop the leakage. In Mumbai particularly, we have huge problem of uh, uh, leakage through basements, through external walls and things like that. Radar is extremely useful in those cases. So for effective monitoring of structures, radar is very useful. You can do before, after grout, before the grout and after the grout, where you can actually confirm to the customer that yes, the structure is safe and will not leak now. Infrared thermography also is extremely useful technique where access is a challenge. I'll go to the previous slide. In radar, you need the access. You can see that people have been standing on scaffolding. People have been standing on the uh, structure that is being tested. Whereas for infrared thermography, it is a remote sensing. If you if your uh, structure is is uh, uh, 100 meters tall and 30 meters wide, you cannot really expect the customer to prepare the scaffolding for inspection. It's the cost of scaffolding will be phenomenally high or abnormally uh, non warranting uh, the inspection. So, uh, infrared, you can find out the voids, near surface voids, and cracking in the in structures like silos, dead walls, uh, hyperbolic paraboloids, and even normal structures. Not that you cannot use them for uh, normal structures, infrared, you can use for. A detection of a buried plumbing line. You know, in, in uh, case of uh, toilets, we really do not know where the plumbing lines are and which of the lines is leaking. So, uh, using infrared uh, thermography, you can identify uh, which particular spot the uh, leakage is quite effective. In most cases, uh, it is effective. And infrared uh, thermography is, uh, uh, can be used for uh, so many other non uh, civil engineering usages like you know uh, insulation where cracks are cracking and insulation is there or discontinuity of insulation and so many other aspects endoscopy is another uh, very useful tool in in uh, seeing where a human eye cannot reach you know above a fall ceiling uh, in case of uh, buried, uh, buried ends of uh, uh, wooden joists or steel joists in case of load bearing structures, heritage structures, because uh, when you have false ceiling, you cannot expect the customer to remove the false ceiling just for ins inspection. Even making cutouts in false ceilings is quite tedious, time consuming and even costly sometimes if the false ceiling is extremely decorated and well painted. Then in this such cases, you can just remove 
the electrical fixture, put the endoscope above and see the uh, structure above, the slab above, whichever is the uh, type of uh, slab it is, you know, whether it's a, a wooden uh, planking or it's RCC slabs, you can inspect the same, show the photographs to customers and only in the identified areas, uh, you can remove the false ceiling for repairs. You can also use false ceiling where you take a concrete cores to inspect where uh, if the concrete cracks have gone beyond the uh, coring section and things like that. After this little and brief introduction, let me let me start with the first first case study number one. In case study number one, we did retrofitting of a school building. Uh, it's a RCC uh, frame structure. The structure was ground plus five story RCC frame structure. As you can see, uh, it had a badminton court with 10.8 meter height and uh, three floors above. This is a school building in, in Mumbai. Then the girder span was about 17 meters. And there were floating columns. As you can see, this is the complete structural system, a ground plus five story RCC frame structure. Of course, it, it, the structure extended beyond the badminton court also on uh, two sides. And uh, on two sides, it was an open playground of the uh, school. Uh, it's interesting, even my kids studied in the same school and probably used the same classroom, but the school authorities were not happy with something that was seen repeatedly. They were, they were uh, seeing cracks in the non-load bearing machinery above in the second floor, third, I mean the fourth floor, fifth floor, sixth floor. They were seeing repeated occurrence of uh, cracks in the non-load bearing machinery. Uh, there was always a, a reoccurrence of uh, separation uh, joints between the RCC and the brickwork above the... Uh, so we were also not happy. So uh, we identified the typical crack pattern. This is how what you see is these are typical shear cracks. Then separation cracks were noted. And these cracks were filled up by the authority while painting, but they were reappearing. See, the general experience is if the separation cracks are filled up properly once, then they do not uh, reoccur. But these cracks were reoccurring. So uh, the school authorities were kind of worried, but they didn't expect uh, what our findings were. Doubtful quality of const construction, though it's a it's a uh, it's a great school, but the construction was not so great. Why do I say that? You know, several cores were extracted and tested for compression. The compressive strength of concrete was expected to be thirty newton per mm square, and it was only about average was about twenty one newton per mm square. So it was two thirds of what was expected. Does this mean the uh, strength of concrete columns, the load carrying capacity was two thirds, of course, depending on the reinforcement, but Mota Moti by and large, yes. The reinforcement mapping was done to check whether the drawings were as built structural drawings. There are equipments which are readily available. Even radar can be used for enforcement mapping, but you can use cover meters more effectively. Not very accurate, but it gives you a, a good, good amount of uh, uh, data for, for doing the structural analysis that you need to do. 3D analysis with actual member sizes using StatPro. Design was checked for the low average compression. I just showed you in the previous slide that uh, uh, though the design uh, compressive strength of concrete was expected to be 30, on site actually it was about 21. So 
we use 21 as the uh, uh, compressive strength of concrete and did the 3D analysis. RCDC design software was used to verify the design. Girders were found to be under designed for bending, which was a very, very startling and unexpected uh, uh, finding. Smaller beams across were marginally under designed and they too were failing in bending. Columns supporting the girders were also failing in design. So I prayed to God that my kids were sitting in the same uh, school and studying. And luckily uh, for us, uh, there was no, luckily for all the kids, of course, uh, who were occupying, <clears throat> there was no uh, challenge the structure offered when the structure was uh, being occupied and fully loaded. This is how the uh, structure was supposed to behave. And this is how it was behaving. If you, if you see the deflection of the girder, 17 meters spanning girder was close to uh, 75 mm. We can see the separation cracks and the diagonal cracks which were reappearing in the non-load bearing uh, system above. This is what I just spoke, you know, uh, cause the settlement columns and corresponding beams due to this deflection slab loads from the beams. See what happens is when a beam deflects, uh, our general experience is that it exerts load on even the non-load bearing brickwork and the non-load bearing starts sharing load, non-load bearing brick masonry or any other masonry starts sharing load and it starts uh, developing cracks. Of, of various nature, depending on the what is the opening size, whether it's a complete wall, what it has an opening, which is a full height opening, full width opening, and things like that. So uh, the, the brick masonry in this case started cracking. The cracks kept on reappearing as as the girders were uh, continually deflecting, and probably. The deflection in the girder was slowly increasing. May not be at an alarming speed, but uh, it was slowly increasing. So we thought of uh, this strengthening scheme uh, for beams. Uh, we said grouting and fiber wrap. For girders, we did steel plate pitching. For columns, we did jacketing. These are the three basic and fundamental techniques of uh, strengthening. There may be more. Grouting is not a, a strengthening technique per se, but you are, you are uh, bonding the fragmented concrete and making it work monolithically. Yes, to that extent, it is, it is a strengthening uh, technique. Fiber wrapping is, is a, a brilliant strengthening technique. It does have its limitations of the capacity to which you can use fiber wrap and things like that. But it's a, it's a dry process, can be done a lot faster. Uh, a bit more expensive, but if the customer can afford. But steel plate fetching we prefer to the main girder, 70 meter span girders, because uh, the, the strengthening that we, we were expected to do or we were wanting to do was a lot more than fiber wrap could uh, handle. So we went for steel plate fetching. And the columns we went for jacketing because there was space and uh, time was to our advantage. So we thought uh, concrete uh, jacketing uh, would be sufficient. This is how fiber wrapping was done, rounding the sharp edges slightly, applying the epoxy mortar to smoothen the surface, applying the primer coat. And the finished fiber wrap beams. This is these are the four steps of fiber wrapping. I'm sure uh, other speakers would have given you an elaborate uh, uh, experience of this yesterday. Steel plate fetching for girders. We we went for uh, through three sides steel plate fetching, two sides vertical and the bottom, and providing through bolts. 
So what you see in the section 2.2 is how we, we prefer the steel plate feaching to be. We, we had 20 mm thick plates and 25 mm through bolts. The annular space of the through bolts is grouted with epoxy. The space between the steel plates and the beam, you know, see, beam is not as, as smooth and as straight as are the plates. So there is always some space between. So that also we grout with epoxy to ensure a complete addition of the plates. Of course, the bolts are there to ensure that the concrete beam and the steel plates uh, work together. The bottom plate, uh, you cannot do inverted bolts because uh, the bottom has a lot of reinforcement. So what we prefer instead is to make a, a welded connection of the side plates and the bottom plate through uh, various techniques. You know, you can uh, uh, take the bottom plate slightly wider than uh, steel plates, little outside have either angles or channels or depending on what the design is. This is the end end connection section BB. This is how the uh, girders look on site after the uh, steel plate reaching. Steel plate reaching do have a little challenge that uh, though the uh, inner side of the plate does not corrode because uh, we fill the thing with epoxy, the outer uh, plate does corrode, particularly in a in a city like Mumbai. So we need to paint it uh, more often compared to any other technique of uh, strengthening, but uh, it does give a uh, huge relief to the structure. Uh, what the person is standing on is the, is the pile cap. Why is the pile cap ex, uh, eccentric? Uh, I think it is because of the neighboring structure of the school premises only, but the neighboring structure and this structure were constructed at two different times. and. Uh, that's why the uh, pile cap is eccentric. This is how the uh, epoxy dipped reinforcement towels. Jacketing just started. Jacketing at ground level, jacketing upper level. And almost completed uh, uh, jacketing. This is how the completed columns beams uh, system looked. See this. This. What are the what are the uh, findings? You know what we what we uh, were happy about is uh, we were able to find out the root cause of the repeated cracking. You know, uh, if we were not that careful, somebody could have just passed it off as a as a uh, separation crack. You know, between two dissimilar materials, and uh, oh, why is it coming again? Maybe, you know, the temperature difference in Bombay, the weather is changing and laughed it out at that. But we were fortunate, I would say, and we did go into the uh, depth of why the repeated cracking, particularly the shear cracking on the non-load bearing uh, brickwork. And uh, that's how we were able to identify the deficient structural design and the deficient structural members, maybe because of the poor quality of concrete. And uh, the original uh, design was, uh, uh, not all that uh, prudent. So that's how that's how uh, we were able to identify. Uh, it's extremely important for complete understanding of the structural behavior. When you are trying to retrofit a structure, you must understand uh, the structural behavior, the material behavior of the structure, and the utility. So many things. And importance of detailed and in-depth visual inspection. Sometimes, you know, in big organizations, particularly what I've observed is uh, they, they don't, the top man of the organization does not top. I mean, the technical top man, one who is a real expert in uh, repairs and retrofitting does not visit the structure. Many cases, the junior engineer visits and, and uh, the feedback is incomplete. Have, we have uh, repaired so many structures which which have not been uh, uh, identified or the, or the organization, the consultancy organization has not gone to the root cause of it. So friends, it's extremely important to go to the root cause and for which the first visual observation by the expert is very important. 
let's look at uh, case study two. This is this is uh, uh, one of my favorite projects in which I was uh, directly involved. This is uh, at uh, Morvi uh, near Rajkot, 65 kilometers, uh, 100 year old uh, stone masonry palace, Ashler Stone Masonry Palace. Uh, this is a, a golden color, golden or golden yellow color uh, sandstone procured from uh, nearby uh, quarries. The place is called uh, Drangadra. If, if someone is from that region, he would know. The Drangadra is also about 60, 65 kilometers from Morbi. This palace uh, is, is a beautiful structure close to 2 lakh square feet in area, uh, ground plus uh, 2 and uh, partially third floor with a 150 plus or 160, 65 uh, feet high uh, temple uh, in the courtyard. So this is called Vagh Mandir because this was constructed by uh, Vagji Bapu, uh, who was the king of uh, Morvi uh, in the first uh, decade of the 20th uh, century. He built it uh, in memory of his lady love called uh, Mani. Her name was Mani. So this structure is locally also known as Mani Mandir, whereas the real name is Vak Mandir. After the earthquake of uh, 2001, the devastating earthquake of uh, Bhuj, which shattered uh, the top 10 districts of uh, uh, Gujarat, it shook uh, many structures in Mumbai also. And uh, I think uh, right up to Bangalore, uh, some some structures were uh, distressed but this structure was distressed uh, very heavily from 1947 that's post independence this structure was uh, occupied by the state government it had several uh, structures but not maintained very well i would say i was not happy with the level of maintenance that had undergone in 2001 uh, this was the kind of uh, distress uh, the structure had after the earthquake what you see here, the ground stone has displaced by about eight inches. And friends, practically every crown stone, about 500 arches, every crown stone has displaced. Now, if, if I remove the crown stone, there is a strong possibility that the arch will come down. But we took the responsibility of restoring the structure. Government uh, gave it back to the royal family of Morvi in 2009, December, 2010, we started, we prepared the drawings, extremely dangerous. While we were preparing the drawings also, stones were dropping here and there because one, uh, the major devastation caused by the earthquake and nine years of uh, uh, the critical condition in which the structure was standing. This is how the structure was. Just, just slip of one stone and, and the entire chhatri would have come down. Can you see here, what you see here is a crown stone has collapsed, but the arch is still standing. So structure tells you that uh, I can stand uh, beyond what your design is, you know. So of course, I think that I believe is the factor of safety that we must have in the designs. We can't uh, reduce the factor of safety. This is how the structure was and we took it. The immediate thing that we did was propping the entire structure. More than uh, 2,000 odd props, I don't remember exactly, but 3,000 props were uh, used to prop the entire structure to prevent uh, further collapse. All the arches, typically what you see in this, this photo here, all the arches were propped, the crown stones were propped typically. Then there are several techniques, about six or seven, but I will try and share only uh, three or four of the techniques uh, that we used. Just, just imagine friends, the queen of Morvi, uh, the royal family, she took back the structure from the government on a lease of 20 years when she was just 85 years old. Can you understand the philanthropic vision the queen had while taking the structure because I'm, I'm sure she is not going to enjoy the structure for 20 years. But she took it, spent almost 20 crores of her own funds to restore the structure, retrofit the structure and then give it back to the society. Now, now uh, uh, a museum is, is under uh, uh, 
creation in this uh, palace. What we did after the propping was uh, numbering. Each stone we numbered, deconstructed the portion which had to be reconstructed. I am using the word deconstructed. I am not talking demolition, I am talking about deconstruction. That is you remove stone by stone and the stone goes back to the same location. That's what is conservation all about. Stone goes back to the same location from where it came off. So you, you identify, it's not easy because the drawings that we prepare are two dimensional. Whereas numbering here is three dimensional numbering. It's quite challenging. I also realized it when I started numbering, I said, how do I accommodate the third dimension now? So we had to change the numbering system after the first couple of hours. And then we had a three dimensional numbering system. Every stone was removed either manually, as you can see in the lower right uh, photograph or uh, using uh, manual cranes or even hydras. When I say manual cranes, it has uh, smaller cranes, chain pulley blocks and things like that, or even hydras, depending on the uh, weight of the stone, convenience of uh, lowering it down. The entire, every stone, as I said, was separated, segregated and used at the same location. Now, this is how every crown stone, it had moved from a few mm to 200 mm. Now, how do we restore this? We were thinking because if, if I have to restore this, I must think of a technique wherein I am able to push the stone back. The crown stone that you see in the photograph could be weighing about 450-500 kilos. What do I use in this case? So we used a simple truck jack. What you see in the left photograph at the bottom is a truck jack, a prop and this person here is just trying to adjust the stone. So with a single truck jack, this person here in this photograph is winding or jacking up the stone. Stone goes back to its original position. The first two or three installations, I, I was standing there and guiding them. But later on, they, their team of four or five people became so expert that all the 500 uh, odd uh, crown stones were pushed back into the position very swiftly, just using a truck jack. So then they had two, two uh, sets of truck jacks and uh, sets of people, you know, three people are needed in the process and we were able to push it back. Now you have pushed it back Fill the gap with lime mortar. Now what? Because in some cases, the gap has widened. The, the, crown, the, the uh, arch has moved little away. So how do, you, how do you ensure that the crown stone works with, uh, is integral with the rest of the, sorry, this is, this is how the thing was. I didn't know that there was a close up also. The person in the right side photograph is adjusting uh, the truck jack and the crown stone above. What we did after that is uh, use of helist, helifix. You, I'm sure you all are aware of uh, uh, helifix. That's a helical shaped uh, stainless steel uh, pipes, which can, uh, not pipes, steel pins, which can be straight away drilled into the stones. So what we did is drill the helifix stones through the crown stone, through neighboring two stones. Helifix pins are about 450 mm uh, span typically. So you grout them, uh, so you drill them into uh, the crown, through the crown stone into the neighboring stone. So this is how, what you see in the right side photograph is what you see how, how the uh, crown stone is fixed with helifix steel pins. We have also started using, uh, because helifix steel pins are more expensive, so we have also started using uh, knurled SS pins, drill a hole, put the pin and grout the annular space with epoxy. This also is effective, it is uh, quite economical, but helifix pins are very fast to install and quite effective, so a bit costly. This is how all the stone walls work. This is a 450 mm thick wall and there were walls of 600 and 750 also. You can see in the left photograph, you can see the day, day light, you know, 
through the entire width. So there is this crack is through. What you see here is a through crack formed by an earthquake. So now how do we restore such a crack? What we did was fill the uh, cracks first, grouted them, and then drilled 50 mm dia, 50 mm dia, two inches holes at 1.5 meter center to center in every wall and every T junction of all the walls, right from the terrace to down. So we did 50 mm dia hole of about 11 meters uh, height from top into the plinth. This, then we inserted a steel rod. Again, 12 meter long steel, steel rod we inserted from top into the plinth, cut off the top portion. This is how, this is how the uh, drilling was done using a simple pouring drill. Of course, little modifications had to be done to that, but uh, we were able to take out piece by piece, stone by stone, we were able to uh, bring it out and through cores were formed. This is how the steel rod was inserted. And what you see in the left photograph is the whole area is grouted with uh, concrete 10 mm down, flowable concrete using uh, you know, high range water reducers. So a simple technique with which we were able to make the uh, no, the load bearing masonry into a reinforced road load bearing masonry, which gives uh, resilience to the structure now, and the reinforcement is not seen anywhere. We also drilled what you see is a five feet, 1.5 meter long drill. So we were able to uh, drill three stones together, put a uh, mild steel pin. Why we use mild steel? Because Morvi does not have corrosion. If it was uh, Mumbai, we would have used uh, stainless steel. Uh, my steel uh, pins were used 8 mm or 10 mm, depending on the diameter. And the annular space was filled up with epoxy. Now, your immediate question could be how did you grout 1.5 meter of epoxy? So, we actually used long pipes. And by, by removing the pipe while grouting, we were able to fill the space and insert the rod quickly. So we, we drilled this through the openings, you know, the sides of the door and sides of windows and things like that. So we did horizontal drilling, inserted the reinforcement up to five, five feet. So three stones we were able to stitch together. Again, this is in the mid, mid width of the, or the mid thickness of the wall. Same way for vertical reinforcement also. This is of course the architectural uh, conservation, which we did. I can go a bit fast. This is how the structure was. These are a few slides of before and after. What you see on the left photograph is a three-dimensionally curved stone uh, chaja. It's extremely difficult to uh, manage. You need real, real uh, karigars to do this three-dimensional because you can't. You cannot do drawing. You can at best do a formation using a sand. But the Karigar has to be expert to give the three-dimensional chajja. It's the same kind of chajja you can see here also. It's a chajja curved in three directions, made out of stone. This is how the Chatri was, where the royal family used to sit before the partition, overlooking Machu River, completely reconstructed. Most of the stone is, is what was earlier, but the, uh, the top arch that you see is, is with new stones. This is how the temple looks from inside. This is how the structure looks now, fully retrofitted. It is behaving reasonably well in the earthquakes uh, now. We, we completed the structure in 2016. It took us about four to five years of uh, conservation and retrofitting. Elaborate structure. You know, and mostly manual uh, centric uh, techniques used. So it took us four to five years of uh, this in 2016, uh, we could finish and uh, uh, is behaving well.
thank you thank you very much these were the two case studies that i thought i would uh, uh, share thank you very much for uh, patient listening to me thank you sir for your wonderful presentation National Institute of Disaster Management and Civil Engineering and Construction Review presents Certificate of Appreciation to Engineer Chetan R. Raikal for the expert lecture on performance evaluation of retrofitted structures case study during the three days online training program on infrastructure health mapping standards and retrofitting of built up facilities from 23rd to 25th February, 2022. Thank you very much. An announcement to all the participants. If you want to share your thoughts on any of the points raised by our speakers today, please raise your hand and we will include you in our panel discussion when we begin. Introducing our next speaker for the day, Engineer Saurav Manjrekar, Director, Sunanda Specialty Coatings Private Limited. He has worked at Sunanda for 10 years. Here, his specific focus is on developing sustainable solutions for large industrial and infrastructure projects, besides overseeing the company's global operations from its Dubai office. He is an expert on corrosion mitigation in steel and concrete structures and is regularly featured as keynote speaker by apex industrial bodies such as Confederation of Indian Industry. He has delivered over 60 lectures in more than 20 countries as part of his technical knowledge dissemination efforts. Most notably, he was invited to be part of the American Concrete Institute, ANSI, and ISO Joint Initiative of ISO TC71 for making a unified umbrella global code for concrete. Saurabh currently serves as Honorary Secretary and Treasurer of the India Chapter of American Concrete Institute. He is an actively involved with the chapter's activities and is a supplemental examiner for the ASI Concrete Field Testing Technician Certification course. He earned his BS from Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago, and his MBA from SP Jain Institute of Management and Research, Mumbai. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much to the organizers. I hope uh, you can all hear me clearly. So once yes, again, uh, thank you for confirming that. Uh, so once again, good afternoon, everyone. There were some excellent presentations uh, by Mr. Shah and Mr. Iker before me. And I will start by sharing my screen now. Thank you very much to the organizers, CENCR and NIDM for organizing this uh, series or this online conference. And thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, this campaign towards improving uh, the retrofitting of uh, structures in our country in India. Can you please confirm if the slides are changing? Yes, sir. Okay, great, great. Okay, so in today's presentation, uh, this is what I'm going to broad, broadly cover. Uh, we'll start with a few statistics about repairs and then talk about what are the reasons for failures of repairs and retrofits. Um, then, I mean, I will talk about two strategies, two types of strategies, strategy A and strategy B with respect to increasing the service life of retrofits. Uh, you've had a, a bunch of so many good speakers over the past three days. So it be, it'll be difficult for me to uh, get into too many types of technologies. However, I would like to cover only one uh, technology that is critical for increasing the service life of retrofit projects and then take you through a few case studies as well. I mean, that is not the only way to do it, but that's one of the good, or, uh, good ways of uh, increasing service life of retrofit projects. 
and finally uh, the story that i want to tell here or what i want to share is that we as an industry or uh, indian fraternity need to have a vision for our structures and our infrastructure uh, in order to how to ensure that they achieve the maximum service life and not just the structures that we are involved with but india as a country so i'm going to talk to you about a vision for the indian infrastructure and retrofitting industry one of the largest inventory of retrofitted structures is with the us army corps of engineers and they have classified their retrofitted structures in the following category 51% as good 15% as fair 16% as poor and 18% as fair so what that means is that even in one of the most advanced nations like the us barely 50% of retrofitted structures perform satisfactorily and the remaining fall into fair poor and failed category due to problems in design installation materials and some other parameters as well so just sort of to extrapolate in india due to say uh, the unorganized nature of the industry performance could be a still more marginal and then can be classified as under for retrofitted structures 45% as failed 25% as poor 10% as fair and 20% as good this is some data from the uk with respect to performance of concrete retrofits so about 80% of retrofits are failing within 5 years similar data from the netherlands and europe about 80% of retrofits are failing within the first 5 years so what does this really mean uh, i mean netherlands is one part europe is one part what does this mean for india what are the implications of retrofits uh, retrofits failing so soon so these failures not only affect reinforcement steel which is produced to the tune of 100 million tons per annum but also the 2000 million tons of concrete that is produced to cover this steel these losses are mammoth in terms of volume uh, particularly in a country like india where reinforced concrete construction and retrofitting is happening at unprecedented levels probably only next to china so what can be the strategies in order to tackle this issue in order to increase the service life of retrofits i have divided the strategies into two parts strategy a and strategy b so strategy a is something that they can be done by optimal material composition and optimal design so so optimal material composition uh, composition structural detailing to resist the degradation threatening the structure for that particular specified period of use strategy a rep uh, represents different types of design provisions for example corrosion protection can be achieved by selecting an appropriate cover and a suitable dense micro concrete or a repair mortar mix in addition the structure can be made more resistant against different aggressive environments by appropriate dealing a detailing such as minimizing the exposed concrete surface using rounded corners and providing adequate drainage just a few examples strategy b is a strategy to control environmental aggressiveness or environmental aggressors strategy b can be subdivided into three different types of measures inhibit corrosion by say cathodic protection corrosion inhibitors protect the concrete by using pore blockers capillary capillary blocking materials chemically resistant coatings selecting non reactive or inert materials example non reactive aggregate sulfate resistant cements and low alkali cements and protect steel structures with fourth generation chemically resistant coatings the best recourse of course can be combining strategy a and strategy b 
within the same retrofit but for different parts with different degrees of exposure so foundations can be different outdoor exposed parts can be different indoor protected parts can be different and so on some of the technologies and strategies that are commercially available and proven in india for enhancing the service life of retrofits are as follows once again these are just these are some of the ways there are so many different ways i am not going to cover all of them so the selecting a reasonable grade of micro concrete or repair mortar that is suitable for the end use parameters of the building over specifying a grade can lead to other complications with respect to durability good quality control on ingredients polymers cements aggregates water and curing water then let's go to strategy b strategy b once again is something that we can do to control environmental aggressors so steel protection using corrosion inhibiting admixtures conforming to astm g109 aci212 cathodic protection to steel using sacrificial anodes conforming to nace 187 and astm b418 fourth generation chemically resistant coatings for steel structures conforming to astm b117 and protection to foundation and superstructure that is prevention of deterioration due to water ingress so these are some of the ways in which we can increase the service life of retrofits and decrease failures which we saw is a uh, quite uh, alarming scenario in so many countries so i want to talk to you only about one or two technologies that are critical for increasing the service life of retrofit projects through some case studies the first case study is the repairs and retrofitting of hotel cabana in daytona beach florida this is somewhere close to orlando in the northern part of florida right on the beach on the sea a few photos of the hotel damaged and deteriorated rc members the hotel being retrofitted damaged and deteriorated reinforced concrete brackets and fins breaking the damaged concrete surface cleaning by air suction cleaning the reinforcement using power tools and spraying of the rust remover and rust converter and then this is how it went forward so the reinf the corroded reinforcement just a second there seems to be a, the slide is not moving give me a minute here rusted reinforcement treating it with a rust remover followed by a rust passivator and finally a polymer modified mortar or a micro concrete now this is an exceptionally good repair job done a very good design very good materials lot of good money spent and excellent workmanship despite that the problem that they were facing was that uh, after uh, doing this within 6 months they were facing the issue of ring anode corrosion that is at the junction or at the interface of the patch repair and the embedded steel cracks for developing and once again the structure was vulnerable to contaminants to chlorides and in turn a failure of the entire repair that's when they approached us to solve this problem for them we studied the case understood the uh, report ndt report and then uh, recommended the remedial action which i'll come to but why does this ring anode corrosion happen so originally the this part of the concrete is more anodic or the weaker part and that is where the steel has corroded there that is where the steel has increased in diameter transferred the stress onto the concrete cracked in in the concrete spalled the concrete and then uh, the entire steel is now exposed after repairing this particular patch 
things have changed all of a sudden now this patch has become relatively stronger and the embedded steel now is all of a sudden weaker or more anodic and when corrosion strikes it will always strike the weaker or the anodic part first in turn the embedded steel now will corrode faster than it should have or would have increase in diameter transfer the stress onto the concrete and you'll see a crack right there at the interface and once again making the structure vulnerable to contaminants so what can we do to resolve this issue 25% of retrofits and repairs fail due to the use of unsuitable materials and that is exactly what has happened in this particular case at Daytona Beach Florida and that's what leads to repetitive repairs repair 1 is not enough repair 2 repair 3 repair 4 and the huge whole life costs associated with this entire multiple repair strategy repair 1 2 3 4 this by the best of efforts best of materials best of manpower so that's why i'm going to come now into one strategy a single strategy of course once again there are so many different ways to do that but i want to focus particularly on this strategy for today's uh, 30 minutes that i have i want to talk to you about galvanic protection or sacrificial anodes so this is the galvanic series where zinc is one of the more reactive metals steel is somewhere in the middle and silver gold and platinum are non reactive or most noble metals so in the oxidation reaction of steel or the corrosion reaction of steel zinc will corrode first steel will corrode second and silver gold and platinum will not corrode what we have done is developed zinc alloy based sacrificial anodes so if you take a look at the jar on the left hand side there's a rebar in that which is in plain water and the rebar has started corroding in the jar on the right hand side another rebar also in plain water water however the sacrificial anode has been connected to this rebar and in turn now become part of the electrochemical cell so whenever corrosion strikes when the when the oxidation starts the zinc alloy will corrode sacrifice itself and in turn not let the steel rebar corrode so how does this help in optimizing our retrofit design so everything else remains the same the rust removal coating the rust passivating coating the only change is that we also connect the sacrificial anode at the junction of the patch repair and the embedded steel so now instead of the embedded steel becoming the anode we have connected an external anode which will in turn protect the embedded steel by as the anode will be sacrificing itself corroding itself and protecting the embedded steel and in turn you will not encounter this phenomenon of ring anode corrosion and you will be able to ensure your designed service life for your retrofit this is back now to hotel cabana at daytona beach florida where anodes were installed and checked at every place for connectivity with the steel shuttering in uh, being put in place for pouring of high strength micro concrete mechanical mixing of the micro concrete and this is what uh, it looked like after deshuttering and finally the chemically resistant anti carbonation coating for the entire structure the structural consultant ms structural engineers was very happy with the ease of use uh, and the, the user friendliness of this technology and how we could be uh, this strategy was even better then the original strategy that they had thought about in order to ensure the desired service life for this retrofit the second case study that i want to talk to you about is jumeirah lake towers in dubai
so this was the condition uh, of the stage of the structure when we were invited uh, this is a high rise structure super tall structure uh, about 200 piles had been cast and after that they got the results of the rcpt the rapid chloride permeability of the concrete the rcpt was slightly more than it should have been so as per design it was supposed to be 1000 coulombs and they actually got a permeability of 1200 coulombs due to which the authorities javza they stopped the project they told the consultant and the contractor that you stop the project abandon these piles and recast new piles as uh, they were not sure as to what is going to happen with respect to durability of these piles that is when the consultant and the contractor uh, i mean they could not afford uh, in terms of time money to uh, abandon these piles recast new piles it would have been a very very big issue and that's when they invited us we understood the case we studied uh, the concrete data rcpt data the steel configuration the soil and then we designed a galvanic sacrificial anode system to protect these rebars now see you can't do anything to the piles you cannot give any sort of coating or barrier as they are embedded but fortunately the consultant confirmed that the steel was in complete continuity and the steel was yet exposed on top and that is why a sacrificial anode system could be designed to compensate for this additional 200 coulombs permeability and yet achieve the desired service life for this particular structure so this methodology with the calculations was discussed and submitted to the javza authorities and uh, after understanding the calculations the javza authorities approved this methodology and this is what was used for this particular project this particular project was completed in 2008 we have been regularly monitoring this project and happy and i'm happy to share with you that we are getting wonderful results and the structure will continue to meet its desired service life so this is the strategic installation of the sacrificial anodes to arrest the premature corrosion that would happen due to excess permeability in the concrete and uh, this is your approval uh, from the consultant stating that this was a methodology used to protect the steel and the pile foundations a few more case studies uh, this is tata consultancy services global headquarters in mumbai where for this retrofitting job uh, in order to again achieve that desired service life sacrificial anodes were one of the tools that were used to protect to add life as well as to protect uh, from the ring anode corrosion effect chatham causeway and the in nicobar islands cpwd has been using this technology for many years with respect to retrofitting of their structures this is ekta vihar in mumbai navi mumbai Asia's third largest paper industry has been using this strategy for their structures. Port structures, Paradip Port, for example, here, and India's tallest building, Palais Royal in Mumbai, has used this sacrificial anode technology as well. Uh, there are numerous codal provisions for sacrificial anode so astm b418 is what i had mentioned earlier is one of the codes codes uh, there are so many numerous codes for corrosion as well so astm b117 is one of them uh, which we have conducted here this is one rebar has a sacrificial anode connected the other one does not they are both subject to 700 hours of salt spray as per astm b117 and after that the bar without the anode is uh, completely corroded and the bar with the anode is as it is the anodes installed in the above projects provided galvanic protection and thereby reduced the tendency for the steel in the adjacent area to corrode the more severe the situation the more aggressive the corrosion would have been in these structures if anodes were not installed anodes significantly reduced 
the future corrosion damage and repairs and in turn added to the service life of these retrofits. Their installation was very quick and easy. Corrosion protection could have could be given to targeted areas as well as the entire structure, depending on what the requirement was of that particular structure. It could protect areas that were contaminated as well. There was no need to remove the contaminated concrete or sometimes it wasn't possible to remove the contaminated concrete. Effective in chloride contaminated and carbonated concrete, maintenance free system requires no external power source and the performance can be monitored as well. So typically sacrificial anodes used for galvanic protection are manufactured using aluminum, magnesium or zinc. There are many reasons as to why zinc is used or was used in these particular cases. Zinc has a high corrosion efficiency, that is higher percentages of electrons are discharged from the zinc as it corrodes. These electrons are available to protect the steel. As the zinc corrodes, it has a relatively low rate of expansion compared to other metals including steel. So back to our service life graph of repetitive repairs. So the red chart is again the repetitive repair, repair one, two, three, four. And the green line now is by using optimal or sustainable new technologies. It is possible to in fact eliminate repair three and four. And going further, maybe it would be possible to even repair, replace or eliminate repair two, three and four altogether. So with that, uh, that is one of the strategies that uh, I would like to share. I wanted to share with you. Again, there are too many others, but more important uh, is how do we make this practice now sustainable and take it across the country, not just to the projects where we are involved. So the Indian infrastructure and retrofitting industry needs a vision. And that's what I want to share with all of you. The need of the day is to have a vision as failures in retrofits is an ever growing problem. The need to see the responsibility concept in the largest repair and retrofitting industry, India. The vision accompanied by goals will help industry, clients, owners, research institutes, government departments, industry bodies, roads, railways, and all the stakeholders at large. Repairs and retrofitting industry must become or must be made a fully organized sector by forming a federation or a trade association. Indian repairs and retrofitting industry should have outreach beyond civil engineering to establish mechanisms for interdisciplinary cooperation to create state of the art technology as well as its dissemination. Indian repairs and retrofitting industry institute can be formed on a national level, which will have affiliations to other such global institution and this will facilitate technology transfer. Develop and implement methodology to hasten documents creation and dissemination within industry stakeholders. Create a repairs and retrofitting code to enhance evaluation, design, materials, field and inspection practices, which raise the level of performance of repair and protection systems. Establish clear responsibilities and authorities for all participants. This should provide the local government of officials, authorities a guideline to issue licenses to concerned stakeholders. Develop concurrently performance-based guide specifications for specific and generic repair and retrofitting designs. This will instill confidence in the owner's mind and also bring a system to approach the repairs and retrofitting industry. Develop environmental and worker-friendly repair and retrofitting methods, equipment, 
and materials that will greatly reduce the adverse effects on workers, the public, and the Earth's ecosystem. Develop a means for predicting the performance of repair and retrofitting systems to help ensure the use of proper materials, design details, and installation methods based upon predictive models validated by experience. Develop and implement a strategic research program for repair and retrofitting industry with universities, industries, government partnership. Create a conducive environment to increase the number of materials, engineering, and construction related professionals interested to upskill in repair and retrofitting practice. This will support the growing need of trained and qualified personnel for evaluation of design, new materials, and construction practices related to repair and retrofitting. Develop selection processes, contractual agreements, procurement methods, and relationship agreements, partner partnerships that will greatly reduce conflicts, rework, claims and lawsuits resulting from disagreements among contractors, general contractors, engineers, and owners. Reference of recommendations in American Concrete Institute documents, ACI 132, can be used as a guide before uh, for adopting for the repair and retrofitting industry. Develop client education programs that will promote awareness of the effects of deterioration and the means to reduce the risk while protecting their investment. Develop improved methods and means for accurate and thorough condition assessment. And develop specific repair and retrofitting systems needs for expanded use, efficiency, and failure reductions. Train and assimilate, assim, assimilate unorganized sector in the mainstream by knowledge dissemination and inclusion in trade association. It would be a national program executed across the country. Skilling is a larger initiative taken by the government of India with a special ministry. Evolve specification standards for performance criteria of repairs matching with international standards in collaboration with the Bureau of Indian Standards. Members of the industry should engage in continuous innovation based on conditions of the Indian subcontinent, as well as training the personnel applicators on a regular basis in a structured manner. And this strategy will keep evolving as this is just the beginning of making an incredibly large sector more structured and more responsible. This should be our vision 3030, that currently if 20% of our retrofitted structures are in the good category, by 2030, more than 50% of our retrofitted structures should be in the good category. So with that, I come to the end of uh, my presentation. Thank you very much once again to the organizers, CENCR and NIDM. And uh, with that, back to Dr. Chandan Ghosh. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your informative presentation. National Institute of Disaster Management and Civil Engineering and Construction Review presents Certificate of Appreciation to Engineer Saurav Manjrekar for the expert lecture on surface life enhancement technologies for repair of reinforced concrete and steel structures during the three days online training program on infrastructure health mapping standards and retrofitting of built up facilities from 23rd to 25th February 2022. I now request Dr. Chandan Ghosh to start with the panel discussion. Uh, thank you for a very good lineup uh, and presentation, especially this presentation. What I was seeing that what are the uh, based on the four decades of data that you have taken uh, and how uh, a projection given for each and every one that working in this industry. And by 2030, that what should be the mandate. And this is something that very much uh, important for the government as well as uh, BIS, uh, our Bureau of Indian Standards uh, that who have 
uh, been dealing with these things. And also many of the organizations like NIDM, my own institution, NDM as authority. And, you know, in the last, uh, when uh, after 2005, the uh, Disaster Management Act came out. Uh, in fact, in the same day, the RTI Act also came up, isn't it? And then another act, I forget. Huh? Sarabji, you remember? On the same day, 26th December, I think, on, in 2005, another act also came on the same day President have signed. And we know what is RTI. And yes. we have also come to know the uh, sporadic, uh, uh, say, issues coming up in disaster management. After act came up, many institutions have been formed. And your, uh, this conclusion as well as suggestions that which you have given, uh, especially for the civil engineering industry and allied building materials and taking forward the repair and retrofitting uh, for the next 10 years at least to plan it uh, is, a, is, a, is something that very, very significant. And almost all the states and union territory now as far as uh, uh, institution-wise concerned in disaster management, uh, that uh, state disaster management authority, then, uh, then SIRD, State Institute of uh, Rural Development, or National Institute of Disaster Management, like we have here in Delhi, another in uh, Bijawara campus, it is almost uh, going to start very soon uh, under Ministry of Home Affairs. And then, <clears throat> The number of codes that have come up in civil engineering industry, which our all civil engineer we know, that is touching to be about 2,000 in a few days or in a few months of time. And there are more than 50, 55 special, uh, uh, like civil engineering division council, under which there are some uh, uh, CD, civil engineering division councils are there, and there are uh, special. Uh, like Soil and Foundation, Earthquake. There are, there are so many expert groups have been formed. And repair and retrofitting part uh, is to be taken up in that direction, maybe under CD39, which takes care of uh, earthquake-related things. And so uh, that would be taken up uh, for sure. Uh, otherwise, because this is an area, gray area, that it is... Uh, very, very important as in when many buildings are uh, getting deteriorated and many of the building like in Delhi, like we are considering Delhi, that most of the DDA building that where even I'm also living, they have already lived their life in 30 years. Now there is no assurity. Before that 30 years, they didn't provide even any kind of uh, load bearing column or load bearing or the load distribution like beam, beam column, which is important in zone four. Those things are missing in 30 years back, even though codal provisions are there in 1993 onward, or even 1962 onward, there are many revisions have taken place, but somehow our civil engineering industry uh, have not taken any cognizance of even microzonations that, like for Delhi, it is in macro zone, it is in four, but when microzonation study came up, in 2015, it has shown that not uh, in zone four itself, there are several gradation have been made about the severity of earthquake related damage uh, to the foundation. Yeah, they have not gone to the building because when it comes to the building, then the, our interpretation from the foundation dynamics to building dynamics, uh, there are soil structure interaction. It is such a thing that even heaviest computer or deep mind kind of uh, now artificial intelligence related computer infrastructure, uh, computer network, or even teraflop computer also cannot calculate these things. It is just only I am overriding the issues that to flag, uh, to go forward with the today's uh, uh, say panel discussion. And I would be very happy. Uh, I think Sandeep ji, Sandeep Shah, he might be busy. Sorry, okay. you had to leave early. Okay, okay. So, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, some questions that I think I would say that uh, Engineer Chetan Riker, please uh, give your uh, 
some uh, view about uh, this uh, today's uh, entire thing that you have been with us. Uh, it's quite quite interesting, and as uh, uh, Saurabh has uh, very smartly identified, it's it's a national challenge. Yeah. Uh, we we must think of uh, a strategy of several several organizations are working on it, and uh, 2030 is a is a good good uh, challenge year that uh, we engineers can take up and uh, really think of uh, retrofitting because we have. Uh, several types of uh, structures. You know, we have old structures which are not designed for earthquake. So, strengthening them for earthquake as one of the case studies which yeah. I had uh, presented, uh, strengthening of the uh, load-bearing structures. Uh, luckily, these structures are not very uh, tall. They are uh, generally uh, low-rise and wide structures. So, they have a natural stability because of the central courtyards in uh, many cases uh, because of the uh, wider dimensions to uh, lower ratios, and uh, uh, what what Saurabh uh, covered is also extremely uh, big challenge, particularly in the coastal areas. The challenge of corrosion. We have almost two thousand plus uh, kilometers of uh, coastline, maybe two thousand five hundred kilometers. I'm not too sure of it, but uh, uh, we do have uh, corrosion challenges uh, all along and. Uh, the entire engineering fraternity has been planning for uh, fighting for uh, solutions. Uh, what uh, Saurabh discussed was uh, a brilliant uh, uh, solution and uh, technology. So uh, it's very, very important and very interesting. And uh, earthquake uh, retrofitting what Sandeep ji uh, suggested of uh, dampers, that also is is uh, not not so cheap or not so easily possible kind of a technology financially, but it's extremely useful for uh, uh, high-rise structures also where nothing much can be done except for, uh, uh, you know, strengthening the whole structure and uh, uh, providing dampers is a, is a good solution. So it, it went, uh, uh, the whole, whole uh, all the three presentations excluding, uh, I won't say my presentation was good because it would not be uh, let, let, I'll leave it to the others to say, but other two presentations were extremely uh, brilliant and good engineering uh, uh, was spelt out through the same. So I'm very happy to be participating in uh, this session, sir. Thank you. Over to you. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing uh, much of the questions on the chat box, sir. Can you? Sir, in question and answer, there are some questions. So can we open that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Please, sir. Go through that. that Uh, there are a few questions, uh, yeah. as I can see. Can I can I take them? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can take it. Uh, there is there's a question from uh, one uh, Mr. Kurana for uh, uh, Riker. Can ground penetration radar be used for rebar mapping? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. A GPR can be used for radar mapping. It's uh, quite accurate. Uh, but if there is bundling of reinforcement and uh, congestion, it might go a little uh, straight. But it's quite accurate. Yes, it can be used. Second question is, sir, what are the retrofitting methods that can be used for aged masonry buildings? See, aged masonry buildings, you can go for uh, uh, having uh, GI weld mesh from outside and gunniting. This also is a very strong technique, which we could not use because particularly if it's a random rubble masonry wall, this technique is very useful. Can do plastering from outside. Detailed details have been, you know, pages and pages have been written on uh, these techniques, uh, right from uh, uh, the Latour earthquake of 1993. Uh, why I could not do it on uh, Vag Mandir is because uh, I mentioned Vag Mandir is an ashlar stone masonry and a golden yellow color. I couldn't be covering it with any uh, cement mortar or plaster or anything, any graniting uh, on the top. So that's how we had to think of uh, different uh, strengthening techniques. Third question from Mr. Arnav Ghosh is how the infilled walls were modeled. Uh, this is for, see, we used a finite element uh, method for uh, uh, this. And these are not infilled walls. These are solid uh, stone masonry walls. You know, the stones are of 450 mm width and even 600 mm width. Next from Anshu Gupta is Mr. Chetan, the absence of shear walls, the non-bearing masonry walls will show shear cracks. 
it is expected due to in and we do consider introducing see rcc share walls were not considered in this particular case because as i mentioned the uh, entire structure actually had walls in criss cross directions the the beauty of this particular structure is it had a dimension of 200 feet by 250 feet and the height was less than 40 feet so uh, it was uh, a very shallow uh, height and wide structure with uh, three courtyards in between so uh, it was a uh, beautifully uh, designed with criss cross walls in both directions fortunately or unfortunately all walls were uh, uh, in in ashlar stone masonry nothing was in random rubble uh, masonry so the interlinking of stones at particularly at the t junction and l junctions were uh, uh, very strong so this was to to extend uh, help but the earthquake was uh, only about 200 kilometers from uh, this place and it was so severe that the structure was badly shaken so uh, that's why it needed uh, elaborate uh, strengthening techniques otherwise rcc shear walls could not be a uh, thought of because it would uh, completely ruin the uh, aesthetics of the structure maybe from inside and outside you know next question from arnab ghosh was uh, why wrapping was preferred in beams but jacketing was preferred in case of arms no see we did uh, wrapping in smaller beams steel uh, plate fletching in uh, main girders the 17 meter span girders and the jackets uh, jacketing was done to columns so uh, because wrapping was done to smaller beams where <clears throat> the enhancement of strength was uh, required uh, much smaller whereas in the 17 meter span beams the enhancement of strength was uh, considered uh, was uh, huge there is a huge requirement of enhancement of strength and that's how steel plate uh, fletching was considered mr rohan joshi and mr raker can gusset plates and stiffeners be used to supplement retrofitting schemes most certainly see once you do a 3d analysis you can identify the pain locations and uh, decide how you want to strengthen the pain locations you know the pain points what we call in a structure so it can be uh, certainly used you know gusset plates and uh, stiffeners uh, then uh, ram lakshmi murugan sir how do you decide whether a building can be retrofitted or not and what are the signs uh, that warn that a building needs retrofitting yes this is a very interesting question it requires another one hour of discussion and i'll try to give uh, a, a brief uh, reply to this see a retrofitting is where the structure is not compliant of the present codal provisions so you take the structure from the present level to the codal provisions that require the structure to be at that is what is retrofitting so you can identify by by doing a combination of the current strength of the structure and the current structural designs you can add a few members you can put additional columns in rcc frame structures you can strengthen the columns like we like we did in uh, uh, the school building uh, structure you can strengthen the beams you can strengthen the uh, other members even walls can be strengthened using uh, a weld mesh or even a complete jacketing if there are rcc walls so there can be several techniques so how do you decide whether retrofitting is needed or otherwise it will depend on imp importance of the structure requirement of the customer because if if you feel that the structure is slightly below the current requirements of codal provision and there is no imminent danger of any collapse or anything in case of an earthquake or any other natural calamity then you can probably try and ignore but i won't recommend that it is wise to ignore any structure if you really want the structure to be safe it's good to keep retrofitting the uh, structures to the uh, current uh, current uh, codal provisions can then there is an anonymous attendee can you have any details for retrofitting of high rise buildings see what happens is high rise buildings are typically a new creation you know of the last 30 years or so and uh, these structures have been designed for the present uh, earthquake codes or wind and uh, earthquake codes so they do not require major uh, strengthening unless the designer is uh, bad or the construction is bad so uh, i i wouldn't feel that uh, major retrofitting is needed to uh, high rise structures uh, particularly in india what high rise we have is uh 200 meters 250 meters 275 and what saurav showed 320 meters is under construction so uh, uh this is this is uh, uh something actually these are well designed and well engineered structures so not much of uh, retrofitting has yet 
uh, being done. But yes, we are into repairs of buildings up to 60 floors uh, height uh, for other reasons than uh, retrofitting. Then there is Lakshmi, is how many members of sacrificial anodes? That's for I think uh, Saurabh to take. Uh, I think Saurabh, some of the questions are for you. So with the permission of Dr. Ghosh, uh, can I request Saurabh to take the questions, Dr. Ghosh, in that time? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Saurabh ji? Yes. Uh, you can yes. see? I can question. see. I can see the questions. Yes. Then we'll see. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. First of all, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, for I mean, sort of discussing the importance of this initiative in a country like India. I appreciate that, and that's very. I mean, uh, it's critical uh, to look into that. I mean, it's quite. I mean, late in fact. So the earlier the better. And I must say that my uh, co-panelist, uh, Engineer Chetan Raikar. I mean, the presentation, your presentation was fabulous and marvelous. And uh, oh, I mean, heritage structure like Morvi Mandir, 100 plus years old, challenging conditions, uh, and I mean, fabulously brought to life uh, by you and your team. And similarly, a very challenging uh, issue with Bombay Scott, I mean, with the school structure that uh, you mentioned of the, uh, as well, very well covered. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, with respect to the questions with Miss uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi, has asked a question with respect to how many numbers of sacrificial anodes are required to be installed for an element. So uh, there isn't a thumb rule as such. It depends on various factors uh, in terms of the steel density ratio, the concrete cover, uh, what is the intended service life that we are looking at and the environmental factors. So based on that, we can calculate and give, I mean, design the number of anodes in order to maintain that service life. So that answers that question. Um, with respect to another question about what about fusion and uh, disadvantages. Can you, can you hear me? Can the organizer, organizers can hear okay, you? Okay. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Now we cannot hear you. Okay, so now, uh, with respect to uh, the, that question about the advantages uh, of fusion bonded epoxy coatings, well, uh, they are like any other uh, coating for rebars. Uh, the issue with coatings uh, in general is that if, I mean, while application of the coatings, also there can be pinholes or holidays in the coating. And also if uh, that the, when the bars are handled at site in the case of new construction, uh, there can be pinholes, holidays in the coating. And in the rate of corrosion equation, the smaller the aperture, the smaller the opening, the more aggressive is the corrosion rate. So the corrosion rate is inversely proportional to the aperture. So in fact, uh, it is very, very critical to go with technologies such as sacrificial anodes and corrosion inhibiting admixtures in such cases in order to sort of compensate for the holidays. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that if you have only coated rebars with these pinholes, through these pinholes over time, corrosion will start inside the coating. So there'll be a coating on top, but then as the corrosion starts and proceeds further, uh, very soon the entire rebar will be, I mean, hollow and just a coating on the outside. And that is when uh, it will be disastrous, the effects of this kind of a phenomenon. So uh, it is critical uh, to have a technology like sacrificial anodes and corrosion inhibitors along with coatings. Uh, uh, Mr. Somebody, uh, somebody else has shared with respect to using impressed currents. Yes, uh, Mr. Anshu Gupta. Impressed currents also uh, is a way of cathodic protection. Uh, it has its advantages and disadvantages. So it has to be decided based on the end use or the end application. The benefits of sacrificial anodes versus impressed currents is that these are discrete anodes and they are all across the structure. So let's say out of 100 anodes, if one anode gets disconnected, there is a break in the connectivity, the remaining 99%, the remaining 99 anodes are still functioning to their fullest capacity and continue 
to protect the structure. However, in the case of impressed currents, even one cut can sort of disconnect the entire system and the entire structure and the entire system sort of fails. Something else is that with sacrificial anodes, you don't really need to monitor. It is a self-regulating system. So depending on the adversity or the exposure, the anode will sacrifice itself and protect the steel. However, in the case of impre impressed current systems, lot of stringent monitoring becomes very, very important because if not properly monitored, uh, excess current can also lead to steel embrittlement, which can be very risky. And that is where, again, these sacrificial anodes become useful because they're self-regulating. So both have their pros and cons. And uh, also sacrificial anodes are critical for these uh, anode ring anode corrosion effects. Uh, impressed current systems can be defined, uh, I mean, used beautifully uh, for a new structure, but in repairs, it might be a bit tricky, repairs and retrofitting. Uh, I think uh, that's pretty much it. There's a question about cost, of course, but uh, this being a technical presentation, I don't want to get into commercials right now, but we can, of course, talk about it uh, offline. Uh, <laughs> yes. Something else that uh, I wanted to add as a comment, uh, I mean, now that the questions are, I mean, with Dr. Ghosh's permission, do we have some time? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, just about a few weeks ago, actually, I would like to appreciate CE and CR once again, where they organized a webinar on connected construction. So that was more to do with new construction and monitoring the performance of newly constructed structures. So as I know, numerous private owners have already started this. However, the government also has taken very aggressive steps. So CPWD itself has started a connective const connected construction to the extent where they are uh, sort of installing IoT devices in their structures to monitor the performance of their structures over years. So sitting at Nirman Bhavan in Delhi, they can monitor and structures across the country. And then that not only monitor the structures through IoT based devices, but also through uh, technologies like artificial intelligence, big data and Hadoop, they're actually getting analysis of their structures. And just imagine uh, the kind of effects that this could have if we bring this to our retrofitted structures and uh, repairs as well, where, I mean, of course, designing the right uh, repair, forming a code for right repairs and retrofit is very, very critical. But imagine the benefits of having software enabled IoT devices to monitor the performance of repair and retrofitted structures. I mean, uh, and you exactly know when the next retrofit is required or not required. What is the residual life in the building? Additionally, uh, I also wanted to share with all of you that American Concrete Institute, ACI, has recently come up with something known as ACI Plus. ACI 318 plus, I'm sorry. So ACI 318 plus is essentially the structural concrete code, which is followed by the North America, many countries in South America, Saudi Arabia, uh, Ghana, and such. So what they have done now is that they have made it very easy for designers. They have made a portal known as ACI 318 plus, where they have connected various codes and documents to this portal. So it becomes very easy for the designer to take uh, sort of connect his designing with the codes. So that is what uh, I would also like to, I mean, we were discussing where there, there are software now available to monitor the performance of buildings of retrofitted structures, which are connected with coral provisions. And the software itself will give you the analysis as to whether your retrofit is compliant to the coral requirement or not. So this is something that uh, we as industry can also think about how to integrate technology, IoT, uh, AI, big data in order to predict service life of our retrofitted structures. And finally, uh, something uh, one more thought I would like to share is that uh, things are getting more and more transparent these days. Uh, we talked about RTI, Dr. Ghosh talked about RTI some time ago. Uh, then there is RERA, which has come in also to give the power in the hands of the consumer, the owner. So just imagine giving this software in the hands of the owner to just know that this is what my, uh, uh, structural design, or this is what my contractor is, is sort of undertaking. And this is what, this is how I can monitor the parameters on my computer. And then I know how well my building or my structure is doing or my bridge is doing. So these are some thoughts that uh, also uh, as an industry, we can think about 
and uh, sort of uh, work on is what I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Saurabhji, for picking out things uh, that which is in, uh, we, we, we must be uh, now concerned uh, flagging even extra things that which are coming up and especially the IoT devices and digital construction that many other things that are coming up. At the same time, I think our participants and civil engineering industry now they are giving a recognition to the to the 3D laser scanning, 3D laser scanning, especially to any of the constructed facility that uh, even drone mounted laser scanning, when we are able to monitor the construction by even drone mounted camera, intelligent camera, and getting it connected to our desktop. And also when 3D laser scanning, uh, with that, uh, we are able to make a as built drawing because before taking up, any retrofitting and other thing. First thing is to get the uh, drawing. Now drawing that whatever blueprints were available in the form of plan, they are now being upgraded with the uh, 3D laser scanning of many of these uh, dilapidated structure or any structure, whether it is multi-story building, not possible to make as build drawing using the conventional way, measuring the tape or other things. But this 3D camera, intelligent camera, uh, which can identify even sub millimeter in X, Y, Z direction. So getting the main uh, as build drawing, both in plan as elevation, uh, especially uh, which, and then going for laser scanning or GPR scanning of the uh, reinforcement that which are provided, which got be created. There are several tests are there to get this data so when SBIL drawing uh, and geometrical drawing is made available and their dimensions are known, then uh, using our already well-known uh, software, we are able to make a simulation. So before taking up any retrofitting survey and get survey of the objective of the, the building or infrastructure, tunnels, whatever it is, so when SBIL drawing is there and geometry are known even to the submillimeter level from outside, then it becomes a very handy uh, for the uh, for the engineers to check that what is the quality of the reinforcement. Uh, sophisticated uh, tools are available to get to know the current status of the building, both outside and also inside. And based on that, whatever prescriptions will be taken of retrofitting that last two, three days uh, that our experts have uh, shown that there is dampers or isolated, uh, various types of uh, even uh, perform uh, various types of facilities that in India and abroad, and the technology that which is now coming up, especially Restoflex that they have not only made their own building, but they have also facilitated same technology in one of the multi-story building so uh, uh, using the same uh, base isolation uh, devices. And so the industry is uh, quite uh, coming forward, quite ripe enough, but uh, scanning of the health and knowing the health is again an art. And for that, you know, uh, with the kind of uh, Saurabhji that you have, you have taken it for by 2030 that how much growth that we have to make in this area. It is uh, no way lesser than kind of health industry or medical industry that making, be it vaccination, be it making mask, like this kind of mask or transparent mask or such kind of devices, Wi-Fi devices, electromagnetic radiation devices, so many things are coming out. I think, uh, and we also know that our human life in in that way, it is living years, or at the most maybe 120 years, but majority they go by 80, 85, majority. So our buildings also, they have also got life. So uh, for the industry here, we let us not expect that uh, or Taj Mahal type of things or material would ever be able to possible to build in the current status, whatever buildings and infrastructure that we are making, especially after 1980 in Delhi, they have got certain life and their performance uh, are deteriorating day by day. 
So their life cannot be like 30 years in the DDF flat, 30, 32 years. So we are making a lot of ornamental things inside, spending a lot of money, but a, a great amount of effort is to, can, to check each and every facility, that whether it is a residence or office building. Uh, uh, so guidelines, of course, CPWD made some manual, but we have to take a lot of such guidelines that already developed by ACI or FEMA or many other European agency, European uh, code or Euro code, which are again there in the last one decade only, they are uh, developing many such guidelines, prescriptive code that which we have to adapt into our system so that uh, we do not miss uh, getting the right disease or diagnostic tool for our built up facility. And it is time to grow and it is time to get ourselves aware with the melodies and also at the same time, new constructions that we are making, the kind of event that happened in Gugao, it reminds us that the kind of material that we are providing and new, new materials that are coming up in the market and uh, the, their performance. Performance are no doubt. Now these days, if I want to make a suit like this, I don't have to go to the tailor. Augmented reality help me, my photograph can take me, it will, it will take my entire board and, and it is ready, it's made ready. So that kind of uh, know-how that has come to our society. So in that case, it is the decision by the consumer or the people the community that we are living here, uh, that uh, while buildings or facilities having disease and it is no as human as that we are having, it is a right whether they should demolish it or not. Let us not wait for that another rules or day to be made by the district commissioner or municipal corporations of respective cities. Let us not wait for that. What kind of decisions are to be taken in the court, high court, or what kind of PIL to be taken up against the builders or against such kind of unethical constructions? Let us not just look for that how uh, insurance of the building will protect me to live safely. Rather, our main aim of this program, which uh, is that it is going on, to get ourselves aware about the various technology, know-how, solutions, performance that available in this, uh, in this industry, that which is growing fast, like other countries also do. Whether it is up is also non earthquake prone area also entire country. So with this, I think, uh, is there anyone, uh, Dr. Garima? Dr. Chandan Ghosh, Mr. Okay. Venkata yeah. Prasad has raised his hand. Uh, with oh, your permission, okay. can I intrude him in the panel? Yeah, 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 please. Okay. Yeah, please. I'm waiting for Mr. Venkata to join the panel. Yeah, please. Welcome. Suresh Tripathi is saying that monitoring already being done for bridges in structural health monitoring. You know that the other day when we are having interaction with our uh, uh, Sanjeev Kumarji, who is a director of uh, Indian Academy of Highway Engineers. So he was uh, mentioning that how many bridges are there? About 38,000 bridges are there in national highways only. And in total, there will be more than five plus bridges on the road only. And then several thousand in railways also. And many of them have outlived their life. So in that case, it, but they are still country is not aware of even with a dot putting in the Google Earth that these are the bridges that we have got in our record. So the work has to start from that level, at least identifying their uh, geolocation with geotagging of those bridges. Uh, so in that case, structural health, uh, deploying structural health monitoring before doing that, we have to see that at least let us have a database of all these bridges, tunnels, and then uh, culverts, which are all part of the bridges. 
uh, only. And then buildings, we have got more than 25 crore building stocks. If we say that if we divide 140 crore by four or five, then it becomes almost one fourth of that 30, 30 crore, 30, 35 crore of building stocks or residential facility where we are living as a family. In that case, you see that amount of work that uh, we can look for what when we take our Saurabh Manjrekar's uh, vision for the next 10 years at least by 2030, that how much work and I should not say the word business opportunity, rather that the amount of work and employment that, uh, that we need and trainers that we needed, civil engineer, uh, to get to know the health condition of all this facility including our 30 plus crore uh, building stocks or residential uh, spaces that uh, we are having. Okay, I think, uh, oh, Professor Bhattacharya is here. Yes, yes, Welcome. yes, yes, yes. I oh. finished my class and yeah, 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 yeah. I just finished my class. <laughs> and okay, okay. welcome, welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, do you want, uh, we have one participant, then we will be having your comments also. Um, today, three presentations are there. Uh, and then I think your light has gone off something in your room. No, no, I have not. Sir? I didn't put it on. I'm going to put it on now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, we have here one Venkata Prasad. Uh, he uh, he raised his hand. So we are calling from the participants that That's good. they want to say something directly to ask the questions to the panel. Uh, welcome. Mr. Venkata, please unmute yourself. Sir, I think there's some technical issue from his side. Okay, okay. So uh, then we can see that uh, uh, the uh, you can you can uh, okay, sir. Uh, okay, uh, you are with us, and uh, of course you are my neighbor also. In that way, <laughs> I have a lot of, lot of freedom uh, to call your attention and also your blessing to go forward. We have here uh, Saurabh Manjrekar and Chatham. I know. No, I know, I know, I know both of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then in the but, beginning, uh, Sandeep uh, Shah I, has presented about the demo. Yeah, yeah. But I missed, I missed most of it because, you know, uh, all this, except the 23rd, all the yeah, other two days yeah. I had classes from 3.30 to, to 5. Oh. Because of oh. this uh, COVID scenario, they have, you know, the <laughs> class timings, they're not in the morning anymore. So on online classes are in the afternoon <laughs> and 3.30 to 5. So I could only join yesterday also a little bit after 5 and today also after. It is always uh, welcome, sir. Still, yeah. you could make it. I don't have much of a comment to make. Classes. No, not much of a <laughs> comment to make. Uh, Anyway, the, uh, I, I suppose it must, it must have been good because the people involved, the speakers yeah. that I have seen, they're actually, uh, you know, backed up with the vast experience that they have. All of them. I mean, yesterday's, today, I could see, yeah. uh, you know, Dr. Raikar, Chetan Raikar, and then um, Manjarekar, uh, you know, they have vast yeah. you know, so, so, it's, in fact, it's, Second generation people doing <laughs> a lot of activity. Uh, I, 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 in 1990s, I think I, uh, 90s, late 90s, I saw Father Riker's book. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good compilation. Uh, very good compilation uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Experience of people. Yeah. So, yeah. Therefore, there's not much to comment. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, thank you for calling me and uh, <laughs> that's nice. Right. Uh -huh. Must have been a very good one all through. Okay, okay. So we'll be having a number of such programs uh, now, uh, as it is. Uh, Sarab uh, has given uh, a later part in his presentation about the responsibility and the kind of old guideline and uh, taking cue from whatever SEI is developing or Eurocode has been developing on the. Uh, repair and retrofitting 
area that how government should work bsi uh, uh, bureau of indian standards uh, uh, how they are going have to work on this despite some of the divisional councils are there in bis uh, uh, then in cd 39 or some of the special uh, session that repair and uh, there are few codes made in 1993 and then some revisions are going on is 1893 now part 5 6 are coming up uh, and then retrofitting of uh, non uh, like brick building up in long back uh, but we have to go now lot of things with the with the occurrence of uh, with this current iot things that uh, chetan ji yeah. was mentioning about yeah. that monitoring of the building built up facility during construction after construction before taking up uh, any kind of retrofitting or repair work so today uh, we have been uh, they have been rather very much uh, uh, put forward doing such kind of things for the generations that uh, we have to carry forward so uh, i think um uh, if uh, this much is all right or we need engineers who understand civionics eh wow oh, uh, lot of skill is needed civionics eh huh? civionics to civionics <laughs> should be talking about okay, drone okay, okay. should be talking about drone uh like i have here environics uh it <laughs> creates uh, it 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 makes the radiation the wifi radiation into randomize the radiation electromagnetic radiation mm-hmm. so it is a is environics so maybe something like that mm-hmm. like we have got iit delhi uh, made in the fit yeah yeah uh, one kind of uh, nano shot they have made that if we spray these things in the uh, they say that they have tested and it is in the market also available uh, for 96 hours there will not be any uh, virus uh, on the surfaces and something many such things are coming out say is civil plus electronics say is civil, civil plus, plus electronics <laughs> well yeah 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 it's very much there it is anyway there you see the sensors are there Uh, the, yeah. the the data loggers they were there for so many years and the wide range of sensors mm. uh, all are electronic yeah. Yeah. all are electronic yeah. yes okay yeah. sir uh, then i give it to ccr for further thank you thank you sir now i would like to request dr garima agarwal senior consultant resilient infrastructure national institute of disaster management to deliver the vote of thanks over to you ma'am thank you very much ma'am and warm greetings to all of you uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to make a vote of thanks and summing up for these 3 days since uh, we have all the programs i'm sure dr uh, professor chandra bhushma sir have told you and i actually missed the opportunity to be part of this program and had to be available to another program for the full time and i'm sure that i have missed most of the knowledge which is being shared through this platform so being a disaster management professional from last past two decades certainly such topics always interest me uh, uh, personally and i firmly believe that disaster mitigation and prevention means that we are reducing the impact of disasters uh, on the affected community and making them more resilient to face disasters a uh, resilient infrastructure will ensure less damage and an early recovery means in- we are increasing capability to bounce back to the normalcy at the earliest over the last uh, few decades natural hazards are causing a loss of lives and uh, large scale damage to the built up environment which results in long term economic losses the country uh, has been experiencing a number of natural disasters particularly earthquakes floods cyclones and landslides even in the last few decades india has registered exponentially growth of construction activities in the towns and cities and it is expected that construction market of india is expected to emerge as one of the largest uh, amongst the largest globally 
and in order to provide basic infrastructure and good quality of life in the cities and towns several central schemes are being initiated to construct houses in rural and urban areas apart from that a huge number of infrastructure that is roads buildings dams bridges industries educational facilities and houses uh, have already been constructed since last so many years uh, which may or may not be compliant with disaster safety norms or the ice codes so it has become important to understand that how is the health of the present infrastructure in the cities and towns and the same issue has been highlighted in so many international uh, uh, frameworks also the sendai framework for disaster risk management the latest one and later on during the asian ministerial conference uh, 2016 our honorable prime minister also spoke about the disaster resilience and first and for uh, foremost agenda speaks about to ensure the that the, all the development projects like airports roads or bridges and all this should be built on and uh, standards appropriate standards and these should contribute to the resilience of communities so this to topic chosen for the training is definitely very much relevant in today's context and i believe it is a need of an hour it is indeed our pleasure to be partnered with ce and cr for this online program and uh, on and contemporary issue i have be, i have seen your public profiles that uh, you have reachability to connect with so uh, through social networks and to the most relevant uh, segment of uh, the community that is a construction uh, community and the engineers and architects which is important uh, to be addressed when we talk about the resilient infrastructure i'm sure that the three days must have been a uh, throughout learning experience uh, i saw the uh, the proceedings of of your program and i saw that there are a wide range of topics were discussed in last few days starting from the infrastructure health report cards of india uh, rehabilitation re retrofitting heritage conservation and uh, new generation materials for repair and rehabilitation for dams use of technology to measure structural health monitoring rehabilitation of bridges and all so there is no denial that uh, rapid visual assessment is an important tool which can actually decide that what would be the future of the particular building or infrastructure retrofitting and repairing of such structure could only be one of the important tools for improving the health of the existing buildings by strengthening their structures and of course non structural elements are also important to ensure even though buildings do not collapse a lot of damage can happen due to the non structural elements of the building so we indeed have, uh, uh, consider it as a one of the important tool which can easily adopted by building uh, user or owner of the building so during the last three days program we have learned so many things new technology i'm sure that gps and using smartphone cameras google maps and drone technology just uh, uh, you were talking about and so many other applications which professor ghosh must have uh, discussed with you so with these uh, concluding remarks i once again thank each and every panelist for sparing their precious time for making this three days program a success i thank all the participants for showing up uh, in such a large number and share the zeal of learning you made each and every session important by sharing your feedback comments and raising questions please i request once again i'm sure during the uh, three days also uh, the the host must be asking you for, for especially for the participants to give their feedback and provide their certificate uh, on the basis of which we will provide you the certificates and which would be received at the at the nidm trading site and you can download your certificate from uh, there by logging the site so last but not not the least i would again like to thank uh, cecr on behalf of nidm for collaborating with us for such uh, such important topic and uh, i'm sure that we look forward for many more such as professor ghosh has already stated that we will have some more some important such kind of discussions and uh, uh, training programs and we will increase our reachability to uh, to more and more participants we will try to involve government officers and officials also who can take benefit of these kind of discussions uh, with this uh, thank you so much once again over to you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am uh, on behalf of civil engineering and construction review and revered media i extend my warm wishes to the people in the gathering at the outset i thank dr chandan ghosh 
Mr. Sandeep Shah, Engineer Chetan Raikar, and Engineer Saurabh Manjrekar for the dynamic presentations today. I would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed delegates for their presence and contribution to make this three-day training session a great success. Once again, thank you all for attending today's session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll take your leave, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Most welcome to our new campus here in sector 29. Sure, sir. And yeah. I'll take this, I'll take this opportunity yes. of your invitation. Sir, it is 42 kilometers every day. I drive by one side of the ring road and go back in another side of the ring road. So I'll take the opportunity of your invitation. But most welcome to see our new campus. Thank and, you. and it was <laughs> such a such a pleasure to see uh, Professor Bhattacharji. Uh, it would have been great if it was uh, for the whole session, but yeah. it is like presenting in front of uh, Bhishmacharya, you know, so it, will be, <laughs> it would have been a little nervous. <laughs> you know, the, what, they, what they have do, done in yeah, yeah. this COVID scenario, I know, the sir, slotting I know. pattern of timetable, it has all become gone to afternoon. Sir. So I have all four afternoons except Wednesday, three three thirty to five. <laughs> sure. uh, I'll take the okay. leave. Nice to see Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right then. Okay.